In this camera basics section, I wanna take care of a few simple things that might be new to somebody who is new to the OM system or mirrorless cameras, but we're also gonna be taking care of file format, which is very important. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about mirrorless cameras, the sensor size, the primary controls on this, and then what I suggest for file format. First up, the heart of any digital camera is the sensor, and the four-thirds sensor in this is a big part about what this camera is, the lenses you can use, and its capabilities. So it's this sensor that is 17 by 13 millimeters, roughly in size. It's called the four-thirds sensor, and it partly has to do with the fact that it is an aspect ratio of four by three. Now, when you compare this sensor to all of the other sensors out on the market, you'll find that it's not the biggest and it's not the smallest. Um, Olympus, when they designed this system with Panasonic and a number of other manufacturers many years ago, they wanted to try to get a sweet spot where they could do a lot with it and still have it be an affordable camera. So uh, yes, there are bigger sensors and yes, there are smaller sensors and there's a lot of trade-offs and pros and cons to every different sensor and they have what they have and that's what this is. Probably the most famous of these sensor sizes is the one based off of 35 millimeter film. This is generally referred to as a full frame sensor and that's kind of an industry standard. It's a very popular term that you'll hear. And this sensor is about half that size in some ways. It's actually about a quarter of the area, but as far as like the typical lens that you use, a normal lens might be a 50 millimeter lens on a full frame system. Here it's known as a 25 millimeter lens. And so we have a doubling of the focal lengths as far as the crop factor in this. And so if you wanna figure out what lens uh, on this is equal to on a full frame camera, it's that two to one ratio, you might say, uh, between what a normal lens is here versus full frame. And so just be aware if you're comparing this with full frame, this is about half of the focal lengths of whatever they're talking about on full frame. Now the four third system began at the very early stages of the digital era. And Olympus, which had a long history of making great SLRs, decided to make a digital SLR camera and it was called the four thirds system. And it actually shared this with a few other manufacturers but Olympus was uh, the most prolific of all of these manufacturers. And so they made some ca cameras like you see here. Now there are still lenses out there and available, generally not from new stores, new in a box, but used market, garage sale, eBay, things like that. And these lenses look pretty similar to these newer lenses that are designed for these micro four thirds cameras. And so they can work, there's a lot of adapters that you can use to make them work, but not everything about these new cameras work with these older lenses. So you really gotta be aware about what lenses you have, and we'll talk more about this. Now, these original SLR cameras had the benefits of an SLR, which means that you got to look through the actual lens yourself with the power of your own eyes using a prism system and a mirror. And then when it came time to take a photo, the mirror would pop up out of the way. One of the downsides to the SLR system is the flange distance, the distance from where the lens mount is to where the image sensor is. It eats up a lot of space and makes the camera a little bit larger than it might need to be. It also complicates the lens design to some degree. So Olympus decided to make a alternate version on this. They take out the prism system in the mirror and just collapse everything together. And it is a mirrorless system because it is no longer using a mirror. Now this is a smaller version of the four third system. So they called it a micro four thirds system. So you're gonna see a four thirds symbol if you look hard for the history of this sort of stuff. And you're gonna see a micro four thirds. The graphic looks the same, but they add the word micro in there. Now the thing is, is that the sensor, um, while there are different sensors in cameras to camera, the sensor size is exactly the same. The lens mount actually happens to be the same but there's a different flange distance, which means that you need to use different lenses. Now, if you found some of these old original four thirds lenses, you could use an adapter. The Olympus MMF3 is one of the adapters that you can use, and it will work on your modern mirrorless camera, and all is pretty much well and good with the world. Not every feature may work with it perfectly, so be advised on that. Now, if you wanna adapt 
other lenses, whether they be from a full frame camera, a film camera, well, the four thirds system has a huge number of lenses that you can adapt to it. And they're gonna range vastly uh, from very expensive to very cheap in the quality of these adapters as well as the prices. There's some interesting adapters like the Speed Booster, which has actual optics in it. It's not just a hollow tube. And this will actually gather light for you and make your lenses brighter because it's um, compressing the image circle down smaller to fit the sensor size on this particular camera. So there's a lot of options when it comes to lenses on this particular camera. Now, as I say, this is a mirrorless camera. So we have interchangeable lenses, lots of good options we'll talk about. We have apertures within the lens that can be controlled on the camera, opening to various different sizes to allow in different amounts of light. Light is gonna be going into the image sensor, but before it gets there, it needs to get past the shutter unit, which has two parts. There is a first curtain and a second curtain. Because this is a mirrorless camera and you need to compose, these shutter curtains are open so that you can see on the LCD monitor or on the electronic viewfinder what you're composing in a photograph. When it comes time to actually take the photograph, the shutter has a lot of work to do. First up, what it does is it closes so that the sensor can prepare to capture an image. It then turns on and captures an exposure. And then the second curtain comes in and closes before it once again needs to open again so you can see and compose your next shot. So that's what's happening with each press of the shutter release with a full mechanical shutter. Lots more to say on this later on in the class. Now, we have a variety of different shutter speeds, obviously for controlling the amount of light coming in to the sensor, as well as stopping the motion of either us holding the camera or subjects that we may be photographing. So lots of shutter speeds to choose from. So these are some of the basics about how a mirrorless camera works. All right, looking at the primary controls for this camera in particular, when you turn the camera on, the camera automatically goes through an auto sensor cleaning. It has a supersonic wave filter that tries to knock off any dust that might be on the sensor. Any dust on the sensor is going to manifest itself as a black spot that might be particularly noticeable in say the sky region or a blank white wall region on your image. And so you wanna have that cleaned as, as much as possible. You can manually clean the sensor. I'll talk about that later in the class as well. The shutter release and the front dial and the back dial are controls that you're gonna be using on a regular basis for controlling shutter speeds, apertures, and taking the photo, of course. On the back of the camera, we have an arrow pad. This is for navigating the menu system, for moving the focusing point around, and a variety of other tasks. Now the OK button in the middle is kind of like the enter button on your computer. When you want to confirm a particular setting, you're going to use that OK button. Now we also have a multi-selector, an eight-way directional control. This is generally going to be used for moving the focusing point around, but we can also navigate the menu as well as some of the other menu options in the camera as well. The camera does have a touch screen, and while the touch screen is not active in all modes, there are certain things that you can do with it and you can't do with it, and we'll get into it a little bit later on. Uh, you can use that in many different cases. All right, when it comes to shooting photos and pressing down on the shutter release, when you press halfway down, the camera's metering system will turn on, the camera will focus, at least that's the default option on the camera. If the camera was asleep, which it tends to want to do from time to time, this is something that you have control over, it will wake the camera up in order to be ready to shoot a photo. Now, if you happen to be buried in some menu, any menu, anywhere in the camera, the camera is automatically going to return to its shooting mode and it's going to jump you out of a playback mode or a menu or anything like that when you press halfway down on the shutter release. And so anytime you want to shoot a photo, it's a great idea to press halfway down to prepare the camera, to get the camera focused, metering going and so forth uh, before you press all the way down to take your photo. Now the camera also has a touch screen on the back. As we mentioned before, you can use this for focusing or for shooting. You'll see little symbols on there and you can turn this on and off on the screen. You can also set this up in the menu. We'll discuss this more when we talk about the viewfinder and the monitor itself. 
All right, one of the most important settings in a camera is the file format. This is the type of file that you are recording to the memory card for the images that you are taking. Now, the basic options are RAW and JPEG, as well as a lot of options for combining these two. RAW is, of course, the original information that came with the camera. JPEGs are a smaller file size. They're more compressed. They're more easily transferable. Uh, so there's reasons why you might want to shoot one or the other or both. So let's take a look at some of the options. Now, when I shoot my camera, I like to shoot in RAW because I get the full information off the sensor. That gives me the most number of pixels. It gives me the most color information. It gives me the most malleable file that I can work with later on. I can change white balance and any sort of changes I make are going to get saved as a JPEG file and I can always go back to the original RAW file. And so if you want to get the highest quality images out of the camera, the RAW file is the way to go. Now, all the other options are going to involve JPEGs. And so JPEGs are very, very convenient files. Now, you're going to have an option of different size JPEGs as far as their pixel count, as well as their compression level, and that's going to end up with different file sizes. JPEGs are great. I use JPEGs all the time. When I want to send a photograph or use a photograph in a program, I'm generally working with a JPEG image that originally was a RAW. And so large superfine is going to be the highest quality JPEG. And then there are various versions where they use either less pixels or more compression to reduce the file size down. And it really depends on what your use case is for a particular photo. Now, my preference is to shoot raw and that way you have the maximum amount of information and adjust it later in the computer. But sometimes you don't have that luxury of time and you want to shoot a JPEG in the camera so that you can have a finished file ready to work with right away. So you might need to play around with these a little bit to get them set up according to your particular needs. Now, the final option is where you shoot JPEG and RAW at the same time. That way you get your RAW image and maybe if you're giving somebody else the JPEGs, they can have those right away and you can do that directly off the memory card in the camera. And so that's uh, just going to depend a little bit on what size of JPEG you have set for that. Now, these are things that you can go in and you can really customize. Do you want a large, a medium one, a medium two, or a small version? And that's dealing with the number of pixels, the resolution. You can also choose different compression levels where it's trying to give you a little bit smaller file size by reducing some of the information that you get in the JPEG. Once again, you're going to need to figure out what works best for your purposes in here. But uh, for people who are trying to get the most out of the camera, I would say shoot RAW. Uh, there's a lot of you, though, that might want to shoot large, super fine JPEGs if you want to get JPEGs out, but you want to get them the highest possible quality. And so this is going to be in shoot menu number one. Let me go ahead and uh, give you a little tour in here, and we'll jump in there and make sure my camera's set up the way I want it to be. Turning the camera on, let's go ahead and dive into the menu system. And I'm going to use the front dial to tab my way over to camera number one. We have multiple pages in here, but we're working on the first page right now. The little camera with the arrow and the little dots behind it, that's OM system's way of saying image quality for still photos. I hit OK to dive into this menu, and you can see that we can scroll up and down. And you can see the RAW plus JPEG options down here in the bottom. And if I want to shoot in RAW, I'm going to set it to RAW right there. If you want to set it in JPEG, large, super fine, you would do so there. And so for purposes of this class, I'm going to leave it in RAW and JPEG just to make sure that everything possible in the menu comes available because sometimes things uh, tend to work better with RAW or JPEG, and I'm just going to leave it set up for both right there. And so uh, get your camera set up for the image quality that is appropriate to your particular needs, and you'll be ready for the rest of this class. All right, there you go. That's your camera basics, and it's time to start getting serious in the next section. So let's get ready for some good information coming.